Hey, what's up? Dave here. And if you are somewhat interested in AI and you have opened up the browser or picked up a phone, then you've probably seen the new release of the Cloud 3 model family. Now, everything going on within the AI space, uh, we can't really keep up, right? Two weeks ago, something, it was Google beating GPT-4 on all kinds of areas. Now we have uh, Anthropic again claiming, if we look at the charge, all kinds of new up upgrades. So really what this says to me as an AI engineer using these large language models professionally for the clients that I work with, like right now and also going into the future, we are going to have to switch and adapt constantly in order to figure out what are the best models for a certain kind of use case where we have to consider performance, intelligence, speed, costs, all of those things. And up until right now, I have only used uh, GPT-4 and GPT-3.5 for really the projects that I work on for my clients. But now I'm getting to this point where I also have access to Claude and with these new claims over here on all of these tests, I decided to look into it and do a quick comparison on really what's the difference between currently GPT-4 and then mainly the Turbo model and these new cloud models. And then also what is kind of like the developer workflow because I have a bunch of projects, you might have that as well, where you use OpenAI and the GPT models and how easily uh, how easily can we actually switch or swap out models uh, without getting too complicated. So I have some code over here for you, which I will also make available for you. And I have two surfaces here, which just um, beyond what I'm going to cover in this video, I think these will be valuable for you either way, because this is really how we set up uh, large language models for all of the projects that we work uh, work on, on in Data Lumina. So I have an Azure OpenAI surface and I have an Entropic surface. And we're going to do a simple setup. Um, we're going to provide it with a system prompt and a simple instruction to create a simple LinkedIn post. We're going to use an LLM for, for content creation. And what I'm specifically interested in is the structured output uh, quality of these models. Because as of lately, if we come over here to, to the models, if you remember the OpenAI Dev Day, it was already some time ago, uh, one of the huge updates actually was JSON mode. And to me at least, uh, I don't know about you, this was so useful in terms of instructing LLMs to provide reliable JSON output. Um, first, it's just having to prompt your way around, please provide JSON output, etc. And really, this has by then become my default, my go-to when I interact with uh, large language models. Even if I don't specifically want JSON output, I still ask it to do so and just take the first key and then that is the response. And why do I do that? Because from a, a, a development perspective, having objects, having data in JSON just makes so much more sense where to the point right now, Yes, even if you're doing a simple, even if you're doing a, 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 let's say a chatbot, you know, where you're sending information back and forth, it still can be very useful to just have the message at like the first key and then maybe provide some extra metadata that you can log, whatever. So the turbo models, um, that is really what, what has been my, my go-to for that. So if we then come to the Azure OpenAI surface uh, and bear with me if I'm hopping a little bit all over the place. This is just going to be a demo based on, on my observations. So it might be a less, little less structured than uh, what you're used to. But here you can look at the response format. So here you can literally say when interacting with OpenAI with the turbo models, you can say, I want JSON. And I wanted to try and see how this works in an entropic uh, in, with the new cloud models and kind of like compare the workflow. So that's really what we did. So I have two working examples where uh, we also have two final results. So let's quickly go over these uh, to really show you first of all, kind of like what is the difference that you can expect in output, but those will be really pretty similar. It kind of like depends on the style and what you like, but mainly in terms of the workflow and see, okay, does it make sense for me right now as an AI developer, as someone that's working with these models to maybe also um, at least sign up for Entropic, get the API key 
and see where I can incorporate that model. So this is not a video where I really am going to review all of these benchmarks and figure out what's ultimately the best model and where it's better. No, this is just going to be a practical takeaway for you as a developer. Like, okay, what does this mean for me? All right, so that said, um, again, giving a little bit of context on the Azure OpenAI service that we use. And for those of you that don't know, Azure OpenAI is just a way to use the OpenAI models, but then through Azure, and you have an added sense of security, which for most of my clients is a must. That's why we use Azure OpenAI, but it's still the same model. Um, so that said, if we then look at what we got going on over here, so it's a simple setup. It's a class, we initialize it, uh, we link everything. So these are all the credentials. Then we have a simple function to do a chat completion one shot. And then here is the generate response function where we give a system prompt. We say, hey, we're going to write a LinkedIn post, etc. We give it some specifications. And then I also say, hey, let's output in JSON format. And we want content, keywords, and title. And then we uh, tied it up into this message format with system and role. And then we send it actually to the API. And then this is really where the magic happens. Now, since we instructed to return this as a JSON ob object, we can then call JSON loads over here and then return it as a JSON response. So if I come in here and just run this one more time, so let me actually see, wait, I don't have to run it again. I already have it here in memory. So I can now look at that result that I have. So right now I ask it to write a LinkedIn post, but I have the content, I have some keywords and I also have a title. And now if you were, for example, to create some kind of like automated content generation where you have a content management system where you want to store all of this, like this could be very valuable information to add. So in the content management system, this might be the title that you use for that post, but then actually the content, so we can query that actually as a key in this dictionary, then we have the actual content. So that is why structured output in JSON format from LLMs is awesome. Now let's look at what that looks like in Entropic. And now up until this afternoon, I had never worked with the Entropic API. So this was all new to me, but luckily it's actually very straightforward and it's very similar to how you work with OpenAI. So they on the website, they have some simple getting started uh, quick starts with Python. And here you can see it's a very similar style. And in terms of the messages, they also configured it exactly the same. So love to see that, that even though they're competitors, they are trying to streamline this developer experience. And now here you can also see if we look at the, uh, let's see the models right now. So they introduced three models. So if we come, so you can see it also over here, but also in the introduction where, where they talk about it. So we have a Haiku, which is not out yet, but it will be available soon. We have Sonnet and Opus, where as you go up, the more uh, intelligent it becomes, but also slower and more costly. So there, uh, they, they basically explain it. Uh, Sonnet is the most balanced version. This is just max power, and this is, be, this is going to be a really cost-effective model. That's essentially how they uh, explain it. And right now you can choose Opus using uh, this model name or Sonnet. So that's what you can see also what we do in here. So let me actually zoom in a little bit for you so you can kind of like see what's going on over here. So we have a very similar uh, setup as with the OpenAI uh, version, but now we do it with Entropic. So we again have a system prompt. This is exactly the same. And then we create the message, but now here we're doing something interesting. And I was, um, I was tweaking with this for some time and I want to share this with you uh, because I think it will be very helpful. And that is because the, um, the Entropic API does not have the structured output parameter like the OpenAI model does, but there are some things that you can do to tweak it. And essentially where you can see it over here, so you can see here, they give some examples of how you can control outputs. So for example, you can just instruct it to do so. So this would be through, uh, just through a prompt. Um, but then what I've noticed is that sometimes if you do this, you still get this weird, this issue where you ask it for JSON output and then the model says, okay, here's your answer in JSON output. And then it gives the JSON like, no, that's not what I want. I just want the JSON, right? Because otherwise you can get, you run into these errors because the JSON loads 
will not work. But here's something really cool, um, and this was really new to me. You have this pre-filling option where you can essentially provide the assistant with an opening bracket, meaning you hint it at, hey, this should be the start of your answer with opening brackets. And then, at least in my experience, the only logical way for the model to complete that is to actually provide JSON. So that tends to work really well. I ran some experiments and I did not run into any issues with that. So then how you set up the message is just um, very simple again. So you provide the system prompt, that's this one over here. Then we have the user where you put in the prompt and then we add another one, role assistant, and then we do that little opening bracket over here. And then uh, what we do is we send everything to the API, we get the response, but then there's one thing we have to do. We have to add that bracket back because this, this is kind of, I'm not sure how this works. It seems a little bit tedious to do it this way, but since we already have the opening bracket here, the API will return the message essentially without the bracket. So you have to stick it back together in order for the JSON loads to work. So then if we come over here and we have, we have the same surface, I can now also show you what this looks like. So that is over here. See, it's still running. Yes. So now we have a similar setup where we have a title, we have the keywords, and then actually we have the content and we can look into this. So now if we compare that, uh, and, and like I've said, I'm not going to review actually word by word, which one is better. I, I think both will have their strong points and, and weak points. And it's much more about fine tuning with examples and your own personal style. But essentially we have created a setup where right now, if you were to create some kind of application or some kind of project for a client, you can very easily swap out different models and get the same structured JSON res response. And I think that is the overall goal. And what I wanted to show you in this quick little video that this is going to be like an ongoing thing. Google will catch up, OpenAI will come with GPT-5, Claude will co come back into the race. And I think this as a developer is really a setup that you should work towards trying to use as little abstraction as possible. So I would also try and be careful with frameworks like Langchain with which I have already run into multiple issues because everything is just changing so quickly. And by just having your own code base with your own like services for, for Anthropic, for Azure OpenAI, whatever for Google, you are very much in control and then create can create wrappers, quick little wrappers around your own services that you then maintain. So are these new models better? Should you switch? Well, it depends. If we look at the benchmarks, probably, if you look at it from like a developer's perspective, it's still going to be like, what problem are you trying to solve? If you're already all in on OpenAI, GPT-4, then continue with that. But maybe for new projects, consider experimenting with this setup. I'm definitely going to continue to do that. I have some new projects lined up where I will probably do both, uh, evaluate them in parallel. Um, so that's really going to be interesting. So if you're a developer and you haven't signed up yet uh, for Entropic, I would recommend to do so. So just to get on the list uh, so you can get an API key. And now, if you would also like to work on AI projects like this, but then helping clients and doing it on a freelance basis, maybe to make a little bit more money, potentially even go full time, but you don't really know where to start, then my program Data Freelancer is something you might want to check out. So disclaimer, this is going to be some shameless promotion, but I just released a completely new version of the program, Data Freelancer, to really help data professionals, software engineers, AI engineers, to really get started with freelancing. This is something that I've been doing for the past five years, making a full-time living off of it. And I also have helped tons of other people do this as well. So far, we have only five-star reviews. People love the program and we have just released a completely new version, making it even better. So if that sounds like you, you can click the link in the description uh, you will go to this page, you can watch this video, see if you like it. If not, doesn't matter. And then if you found this video helpful, then please leave a like and also consider subscribing. And then I'll see you in the next one.